What's happening guys? Welcome back. Uh, so today for this one, we're going to mostly be talking about nutrients, like a little bit of an introduction uh, to the basic, you know, of what you're looking at beyond the NPK. Um, because that, that actually does matter and make a very, very big difference. So NPK, uh, I'm just, I googled up a, a plant nutrient list just so I can rattle it off. Just because I work with this every day, guys, does not mean I'm going to memorize it. There's just, there's just no way. Uh, there are hundreds upon thousands of different types of things that you can add that is going to add something to your plants. So, and, and in different amounts. So starting off for NPK, you have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, as we know, potassium can be found in bananas. Phosphorus can be found in ash, wood ash. And nitrogen can be found in uh, urine. Um, well, you know, the bacteria, when bacterial is already ran, uh, through the uh, the fish water, you know, process that. Um, you can get it from uh, from leafy greens, uh, green uh, growth. That that's what you know nitrogen is. Uh, grass, for example. Uh, those are what's going to be called primary nutrients. Primary nutrients is the main things a plant needs to survive before anything else. Like it needs those three, mandatory. You mess that up, it's not happening. Um, those are the backbone off of your nutrients. And of course, you have secondary nutrients, things such as calcium, uh, magnesium, iron, zinc, uh, manganese, copper, sulfur, boron, stuff like that. Um, there are other, uh, other things that are more considered along the micronutrients. Um, uh, let me think of one. I think sodium nitrate that's a uh that's that's a fish water example uh nitrogen plus chillin yep yep i believe uh let's let's look up some micronutrients for you guys micro and these are mostly things uh there we actually do have a way here that, sorry about the pause. Um, so really good options. Uh, eight micronutrients. That's a good one. So boron, chlorine, copper, iron, uh, manganese, molybdenum, MO. I'm probably saying that wrong. Zinc and nickel. Those are very good micronutrients. And I'm sure you're like, what? That's metal. Yeah, th th all this stuff is found in our soil. In fact, we ourselves consume these micronutrients to some scale. Um, plants are just like us. They have to eat. They have needs. They have nutrients far more dense and beyond our you know, capability of fathoming half the time, uh, I feel. We're always learning something. Uh, so in terms of nutrients, it's very important about where you source it. Um, as I said in another video, and if you haven't seen that, go check that out. It's actually an intro to Soil Food Web, um, just to kind of help, you know. I had actually mentioned that technically, you know, you're getting poop and uh, excrements from all of the Soil Food Web, you know, things. Uh, after they've processed and eaten what they like, there's going to be an offput um, that's going to uh, ultimately increase fertility to some extent in your soil. Well, uh, we can use larger versions and larger animals to amplify that. Uh, we can build upon that, so to speak. Um, generally, your manures are going to have most of your nitrogens and very low PK. If you've ever gone to like Walmart or anything like that, um, you've seen the NPK with the micronutrient list. We all know you want a high nitrogen if you're going to be doing something uh, you know, with a lot of growth, explosive growth specifically. Uh, for example, tomatoes, uh, after they've matured and uh, they, they explode, so that way they can start producing uh, fruit. Well, in that beginning stage, even if they are initially fruiting, you want to give them very high nitrogen. Grass loves nitrogen. That's basically all it needs. Um, it's mostly just nitrogen. Um, P is going to be your uh, phosphorus, phosphate, I believe. Yeah, I could could I could be getting that wrong, but um, generally that's going to be for better fruiting, and then your K 
is mostly going to be for root production. Uh, most people don't realize that. So, uh, me personally, when I was making our, uh, I would try to make our own dry amendments and stuff. So, coffee is really high in nitrogen and has a severe amount of micronutrients. It's a seed that's been roasted and ground, and then uh, water's been ran through it to where the substance itself is left behind. Uh, mixing a high nitrogen with something with essentially no nitrogen, um, it, it was fairly beneficial for myself. So for me, believe it or not, I actually used wood ash, bananas, and uh, uh, coffee. Mixing banana peels in, in a paste equivalent to the nitrogen amount, and then mixing uh, the ash in, you know, wood ash, to, uh, you know, again, uh, the same amount, so you get one-third, 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 would be an all-purpose one-to-one-to-one ratio on average it's going to change a little bit guys uh, especially if you're making uh, nutrients yourself you're going to learn to kind of feel it but the idea is that you're starting you know that that all-purpose fertilizer whenever you mess with that NPK that's what's going to adjust what you're using it for so like I said if I used coffee I uh, just went to a coffee shop get the coffee boom throw some nitrogen on I did that at the beginning of season I actually didn't add any wood ash, just strictly nitrogen. Get those babies going. Why? They're not producing yet. I don't have to worry about that for a few months. Not only that, we grow in sand, so it helps build up the, the, the girth of the soil, so to speak, and it also attracts, um, you know, uh, wild worms. That way, you know, it can actually start to be processed. Um, <clears throat> so all of that just kind of benefited for what I was using in that point. Like I said, I just needed nitrogen. Uh, I'm growing in soil, so it's not too crazy. Now, when I was growing in potting soil, it was a little different, um, and we'll get to that towards the end. I want to start out more with a, um, a garden soil for you know the beginning of this one. So whenever I'm fruiting, uh, I generally add more wood ash, and the downside to wood ash is it's um, it's alkaline, very alkaline. Sometimes I would have to add uh, like an apple cider vinegar uh, to adjust the pH of the water before it hit the, um, the, uh, the, the plants because the, uh, the acidity and the alkalinity needed to be balanced to about a, most plants like a 7, 7.0 seem to be pretty, pretty efficient, 7.0, 7.5, um, most plants tend to, to kind of be over there. Uh, it is going to change, different plants have different needs. But that's a good starting point, generally, uh, from what I've learned. Now, if I was producing uh, just a whole lot of, um, of, uh, of fruits, you know, it, we're in fruiting season, it is full production, I'm probably going to be adding more fruits to, uh, to, my, to my teas. So I'm going to add bananas, obviously. Uh, just some old, overripe bananas work just fine. Um, you just mash them up, you throw them in the pantyhose. I throw everything in pantyhose and uh, suspend it. Uh, you suspend because of anaerobics and stuff. We can get into all that later. Uh, maybe I'll do a composting video for you guys. Um, so for something like that, we um, I've also added uh, orange peels, oranges. Um, the acidity off those can sometimes balance it. So uh, just make sure you're monitoring your mix and don't feed your microbials like if you can uh, do your fruits first and then add your soil, so that way your pH doesn't get thrown too crazy and your microbials can survive, you can actually add your, um, your either your fungal or your bacterial or even both mix towards the end and amplify those amounts before you spray it for your, your soil life, which get, will give you uh, an additional boost because that means what you're feeding your plants, you're also giving them the, uh, the materials and the... Uh, the ability to process it so remember we're feeding the soil we're gonna start out with just feeding the soil and then at the very end I'll talk to you guys about foliar sprays which is pretty cool um, <clears throat> for a mix like that I actually start out at about a 1 to 10 1 to 25 somewhere in there um, trial and error guys start on a small portion if you like it do a larger portion um, that's pretty much a, a really good rule of thumb because Losing one plant that you, not, you didn't really mind that you can maybe clone easy or something is going to be a whole lot better than losing your whole crop. 
So, uh, let's see, NPK. Yeah, and, and so what most people don't realize is ash actually has the majority of your micronutrients. So, um, a lot of your micronutrients also comes from mulching. So we, we do mulch. Um, there's an up and a downside on everything. So don't look at anything like it's the miracle cure. For example, adding too much nitrogen can cause an aphid or pest outbreak. Okay, that means you need to drop your nitrogen a little bit or adjust your PK to where it kind of elevates it. Um, you can also have nutrient lockouts uh, where it looks like it's nitrogen deficient, for example, and you keep feeding it nitrogen and then your plant dies because you gave it so much nitrogen or so much PK that the plant just couldn't process the nitrogen. And so instead of burning it, you actually gave it a nutrient lockout. Um, so start small. And in things when I'm making my own mixes, I find it's a little bit better. Uh, a lot of you guys, especially if you've seen my soil food web, I mentioned real briefly inorganic uh, fertilizers. So something like that, I actually use semi-regularly and I use it as a backbone for my fertilizer mixes. Uh, I go get the all-purpose, just like the one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one kind of thing. Um, and I don't add much. So every five gallons, I probably just sprinkle a little bit in. Like I said, it's just to give me a backbone. Um, because I use the, um, a lot of times if I can, I'll actually use fish water. So out of our tanks, if it's been very clean, there's been no outbreaks, no chemicals in the last six months or so. Or uh, like our outside tanks, that's actually what they're for, um, is watering and stuff. I'll uh, suck out the water into the five-gallon bucket. Add, you know, the I, I like to add the inorganic fertilizer at the uh, the very beginning or the very end because it's kind of a salt and it just depends on the, what mix I'm making. So if it's mostly just going to be straight up nutrients, I'm not worried about micro life, then I'll just add it in to where it gets a nice, consistent, even consistency. If I'm worried about the micro life, I'll either do it separate or add it at the end right before I add it onto the garden. Just that way, the 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 microbials and stuff in there don't die or the fungal doesn't die since salt kind of conflicts with them. Um, and that tends to work out pretty well for me. Um, I tend to go under before I try to go over because underfeeding, I mean, they're, they're already fed. Um, and if you're, you're wondering how, don't be afraid to check out our chicken tractor uh, video, uh, homestead update or chicken tractor intro um, on what we've learned so far because it um, it explains that we're actually technically fertilizing year round. Um, uh, I also use mulch layers, which, as I stated, have their ups and downs. So wood on a mulch layer actually it sucks out nitrogen for the first year on average, unless you begin to compost it, um, which can kind of accelerate that. But it kind of turns it into soil afterwards, so it's not the greatest for the mulch layer, but it's great to add under the mulch to kind of keep it from sucking all that nitrogen out. Um, sometimes I'll add nitrogen in with it just to kind of help. But the wood mulch, um, it's, it's got micronutrients. It's a great place for uh, micro life. Um, it also uh, works as an insulator, so it keeps the, the plant roots cool. And it works like a sponge, so it actually holds water to slow down your need for irrigation. Um, it, it's it's an, it's a backbone, actually, uh, for, for my climate where it's just so hot. It gets up to 100, 110 degrees fairly regularly. I mean, these plants struggle, but you put a mulch layer on and they could not care less, especially if I'm not watering um, from the air, an aerial uh, if I'm just using a drip system or something a little more direct, they do wonderful. Um, it's for, you know, molds and mildews and things that may break out during summer. Uh, so so using, a, using a wood ash is a really good part because it also adds what's called carbon. Uh, carbon is, uh, some of you may know through like makeup products or um, toothpaste, there's something called activated carbon. Now what that is, that's actually where something like a tree has been heated and all of the gaseous uh, parts of it have left. It's literally just carbon. It's, it's DNA unidentifiable, theoretically. Like you can eat it straight. Um, it, it makes everything vacate that substance except for the carbon uh, through the, the heating process and the gas exchange and stuff that they do. 
uh, which is pretty cool. And if we ever build a, a charcoal chamber, I'm definitely going to post a video on that. I've, I've been wanting to do it forever. It's just an awesome design. Uh, so anywho, <clears throat> your, your carbon, uh, generally when you burn something, there's going to be carbon present. Adding carbon, uh, most of my soils, I run it off of what's called, uh, everyone knows the pot, it's called terracotta. It's terra preta, terra preta soil. It's an, it's an Amazonian clay soil. And I find that that specific soil tends to work for everything, including fixing sand, um, which we use here. And sometimes I do add clay. Like I said, it, it, uh, I, I don't know if I said it in this video or another video, it actually has like an ionic charge kind of thing. So it actually is more of a, a salt attractant. That's why, you know, in clay, you can have a salt buildup much easier than you could in sand, also because of drainage and stuff um, and evaporation and all that. But anywho, um, I'm not going to lie, I forgot where we were, guys. Um, yeah, so carbon, carbon. Uh, carbon, uh, it's going to increase the soil because you can actually, believe it or not, feed composting worms and earthworms straight up carbon. Like, they, they love that stuff. Um, it's a very great, it's an, an amazing grit. So, um, and again, it also works like a super sponge. And um, people even use it in aquaponics um, and, and other, you know, things just because it, it, uh, it absorbs so well. So as you know, for the first year, mulch can tend up to suck up nitrogen. Carbon can suck up nutrients across the board, whatever you feed that thing, for up to five years in some cases, um, depending everything's going to depend. Like sometimes it'll cap out in six months. I'm just saying that's like the scale. Um, yeah, no, like it, 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 it'll actually, wood ash can negatively impact your garden if used inappropriately. Too much carbon will destroy your garden until the nutrients have been built up. Like it, it small amounts, guys. That's why I use wood ash. And, and that way, small amounts of that carbon's already present. So whenever I pH balance it and stuff and I add it into a nutrient mix, it's actually sucking up that nutrient mix. So I go really heavy on the nutrient mix. And that's actually one of the reasons that I add um, the miracle Grow because it, it'll suck that up. Like I said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's uh, what was that? That towel it was a, a sham wow. It's the sham wow of nutrients. It will suck it all up. It, it doesn't... Um, you know, it, it, it's amazing for the soil. It, it's, it's wonderful. So uh, in terms of the fruits, the, the reason the fruits generally add the P out of NPK is going to be because they are fruit. So it takes, it takes a lot of phosphate or phosphorus to create this fruit. So guess what that fruit's mostly going to contain? Taking something like that and adding it, it's naturally going to boost that. Um, and like I said, so that's, you know, we have our NPK built, that's all the basic ones. And then, like I said, the micronutrients get adjusted. Um, I like to use the, the acidity fruits, like I said, to help balance the pH of the mix, make it more stable. Also, uh, coffee can tend to be a little acidic as well. So those two paired against the carbon and the ash tend to balance that out. I generally don't have to use uh, vinegar, if any at all. And if it's uh, too, too acidic, you can always make it alkaline by either adding more or adding like a baking soda or something to, to you know, just make it a little more alkaline. Um, so that's just going to be mostly fruits and things. If you're looking into more micronutrients, I find it best to add um, more woody substances, but that's mostly when I'm going to be working on more fungal. So that's why I also have the mulch layer. Uh, because of the you know the other nutrients there and the way the fungal will break things down because uh, that mulch layer is also like a habitat for different funguses uh, to grow positive uh, beneficial there are beneficial and so somewhat negative funguses and bacterias as you know um, so that's going to be it for the the soil the next piece is going to be in pots so when you're gardening in pots it's the exact same as soil but you really have to dial it down. So what I generally do is the same same exact thing, but I make smaller mixes. I also make them anaerobic, uh, not in such a way that they uh, 
I don't want them to be go completely anaerobic and have negative effects, but I stir them. So I only stir them a couple times <clears throat> because you want it, you really want it to, to seep all out. Then I'll filter it through pantyhose. That way it's mostly a liquid mix. And I'll cut it a lot more than what I would cut with soil. So it, uh, I would use it in such a way you add it, like, like a hydroponic setting, uh, use a quality soil mix, and then add it in very micro amounts when you're watering already, and then monitor the plant. That seems to do a little bit better. It is a little bit more work, but um, you're, you're still feeding the plants what they need. You're still feeding the plants what they like. And you mix that up with some earthworms in a, a fabric pot, oh, you'll, you'll never turn back. That, that's one of the best experiences in my life was with a fabric pot because it'll keep it from going anaerobic. Um, <clears throat> as you know, there's three things when you're considering nutrients. Your nutrients, your water, and your, your light. All three of those need to be balanced. So especially in an indoor setting, it's more uh, prominent, you know, having complications with that than an outdoor setting naturally with the way uh, the sun is. You know, it's the ultimate <clears throat> heat source and everything. So indoors, you're not going to have all that. Overwatering is very easy. You can help with that by increasing nutrients and increasing light. If you increase those, you're going to go through more water, which means you can water more regularly. That's why I combine micro amounts of fertilizer with the water. A little bit goes a long way, so to speak. And, and I also, I just didn't really have any uh, complications in soil. It takes two weeks indoors on average to see full effects of any nutrient burn or any complications. It's a very lenient soil, uh, you know, thing soil is compared to a hydroponic, which can kill a plant in less than an hour um, if it's improper and improperly made and watched and everything. So, and washed. Uh, <clears throat> so anywho, uh, with the soil, just monitoring that Try to keep your water in micro amounts and always keep the, the nutrients in micro amounts and build it up little by little by little. Because if you get, too, again, too much nutrients for too much light, the plant's going to burn. Obviously, there are extreme versions to where this does not apply, such as dumping gallons of nutrients and gallons of water on a plant outdoors and expecting it not to die. Use your head. Um, you know, it starts small and work up. These plants have to build up a tolerance. Are they in the phase? Um, whenever you learn to grow, there's actually three main phases. There's going to be the, the, the seedling, uh, well, four. We're going to do four phases for this. There's going to be the seedling stage for the first two weeks. They don't need any nutrients. They don't even want aloe vera. The next uh, number of weeks or whatever, when they're reaching maturity, so... Their first greens are, you know, they're in, uh, the first true greens uh, are in, and they're starting to grow, but they don't have the vigor of really growing. They're in their teen years, they're still trying to figure out what they want to do, you know. Um, aloe vera, small amounts of nitrogen, oh, mwah, perfect. Now, there's going to be a growth to where growth is the most, the conversion is there. So, again... The three things I told you about the fluctuation during this time are important. That's going to determine the size of your plant now. It's in its major growth phase. Have fun. Be safe. You know, moderate it. Pay attention, but have fun with it. Uh, really spend that time to learn about your nutrients because that plant can recover easily during that time. So even if you mess up, you're more likely to regain control of that situation by simply flushing it. And not and not fertilizing for a few weeks um, now during the fruiting phase it's not gonna be a whole lot of growth but it's gonna be a whole lot of fruit if you LST things correctly we'll do an LST video later on um, you can obviously increase the fruits but it's a little bit gonna be a little bit more temperamental uh, on like you can't just push a whole bunch of PK into it um, it's still gonna want some nitrogen depending on what you uh, it depends on what, like herbs, when they're flowering, they hate nitrogen. Some of them, not all of them. Again, it's not, but like take a, uh, 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 a basil plant. I fed it nitrogen one time and it killed it. Uh, a tomato plant, you feed that thing nitrogen whenever it's uh, growing tomatoes, it's just going to start growing more stems. It, like, you know, it's not, it's not going to care as much. 
Um, but what you feed it can't, you know, obviously control control the fruits. Um, that's a pretty good intro, I feel, for, for that. Uh, so we'll go ahead and skip to the last part. I'm sorry, guys, this is going to be a little bit long of a video. The last part is actually going to be foliar sprays. And this, as a gardener, is your bread and butter. I mean, it is... You, you can fertilize the soil, but think of the plant as not an upper part, but a full part. So you have your fruits, you have your vegetative, and your roots. All of it's the exact same. It's all exposed to the exact same conditions. One's below ground, and one is directly above ground. It's, it's location with the ground is the only thing that changes. It doesn't actually change the, uh, the overall, uh, how do you put it, like the uh, conditions it's in. If it's hot outside, if it's 110 degrees outside, uh, I hate to break it to you, that soil is going to be a low warm. So those roots are going to have to adjust to it just like that. The whole plant's heating up. Um, so when you're doing a foliar spray, uh, if you're adding in so soil and microbials and stuff, you have to be very careful. One twenty-fifth of what you feed it soil is the maximum it can generally handle on a foliar spray because it's a direct feed. You're feeding the plant. You're no longer feeding the soil. So when your soil gets copacetic, you can actually dial in to the plant. And there is a million ways you can spin this. You can put pest repellents, you can put mold and mildew repellents, natural organic ones, while you're already fertilizing and have a fertilizer value. Now all of that would have to be considered. Uh, for example, I've used spoiled milk before to kill mold and mildew on a crop. Uh, it, was, it, had, it was still in the younger stages, so it had time to mature. It was, it was no big deal. It's not like it, we didn't eat the fruits that it was clear, you know, clearly already producing. Um, that worked phenomenally, but I had a little bit of a calcium buildup with excessive use, I found. Uh, so if I found something to, you know, what I started doing is just adding small amounts, basically. So that way it wasn't really too complex. Um, I also use the miracle Grow garden sprayers. Uh, I actually take the jug off, take the miracle Grow out, and uh, like I said, we'll, we'll use it little by little later. And uh, I'll fill up that jug with what's in my, my fertilizer bucket and spray it out. When it starts to clear up, just chunk it on the garden, get another jug, fill it up, put it back on, spray it out. Five gallons can treat almost an acre for me, depending on how you use it. It's a foliar spray. It's a direct feed. And what I do is I do excessive feeding. So I actually do a whole watering Um because now I'm feeding the soil, I'm feeding the plant, I'm watering everything, so it's also slow enough that it'll also, also wash it off. And if I have soil, good soil, from a, a healthy area, and I, um, uh, if I take that, that said soil and put it in my tea, well, the, the beneficial microbes that are protecting the plant and the roots are now on top of the plant, and guess what? We have more protection. Um, Believe it or not, soil does, you know, kind of fly through the air sometimes when wind picks it up and carries it. Soil erosion, it's a thing. So that can get on top of the plant and actually infect it. So whenever you don't have any pests or, or, or predators or anything that are causing complications to your plants, but yet they're dying of diseases, that can be why. So something as simple as that can fix that. Um, so I'll dry, something like that, I would dry out my garden really well. And then I would just sit there and slay it with that stuff, just slinging it. Um, and I would do, uh, I, I feed from the top, you know, I, I cover the plant, but I water. I'm watering, but I'm starting from the top. And I have received maximum benefits from stuff like that. The plants that we have outside right now, haven't, uh, if you haven't seen that, like I said, go ahead and go check out the, the homestead uh, tours. But we haven't even fertilized them right now. Um, I actually broke or gave away or something in my last uh, sprayer, so I just haven't had a chance to pick one up. But when, whenever we do, I'll, I'm going to start fertilizing again. And that's it, it is about to change the game, uh, especially since now we're doing a lot more organic and agroforestry techniques. Um, so that's going to be pretty much it for nutrients. Uh, I'm really glad if you guys hung through this with me. Uh, I know it's a lot, uh, but that's... Honestly, the majority of what I know about nutrients, uh, especially just getting started out um, and not really using too many 
scientific terms or anything. So y'all have a good one out there. Don't be free, don't forget to like, subscribe. Uh, feel free to drop a comment. Uh, lo I love communicating with you guys. If you ever want to, you know, anything specific, let me know. I'll do a video on it. And if I haven't learned it yet, we'll learn it together. Uh, that that's like I said, it's kind of what this channel is about. Uh, so be nice out there, and we'll see you on the next one.